Good morning, everyone. I'm going to call to order the Water, Wastewater Infrastructure and Sustainability Subcommittee. It's a mouthful. I believe uh, Councilman or Vice Mayor Waring is on the phone. I am. Okay, good. Then uh, call to the public. No cards. Uh, minutes of the meeting of November 7th, 2018. Any corrections or motion? I'll make a motion uh, to approve. Okay. Second. We have a motion second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Brings us to consent items. I believe there are two of them. Just one? Uh, just one? Yeah. Item two. Uh, any questions? Motion? I move to approve. Second. We have a motion and a second to approve. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Motion carries unanimously. Item three is the state and federal legislative agenda. And we are, the legislative staff is coming to the table. <laughs> Good morning, Madam Chair, Councilmember Stark. Uh, today, um, we're presenting uh, to the Wastewater Water Infrastructure and Sustainability Subcommittee the last few items for your approval for the state and federal agendas. And we'll start, we'll just dive right in uh, and have a, a senior dote dive into the state legislative agenda. Okay. Good morning, Mayor and Councilman Stark and Vice Mayor on the phone. Um, so I will start with our guiding principles. The first one is to preserve state share revenues, which are monies that are allocated to the cities by the state, which make up about 30% of our um, budget. Second is to oppose any unfunded mandates, also to protect local authority. And the fourth, to maintain sustainable water resources. And this is important currently as the state is working on a plan um, for what will happen during shortage years, and the city has been very involved in that, and we want to continue being involved in those discussions. Um, as it relates to this subcommittee, the item uh, that I have is uh, the Volkswagen Clean Diesel Settlement Money. So in 2016, Volkswagen was sued by the U.S. Department of Justice for violating the Clean Air Act. And this lawsuit resulted in an agreement that allocates dollars for damages for projects to improve air quality. Currently, Arizona is set to receive around $57 million over a 10-year period. And um, from the city perspective, we recommend working with the state in order to receive funding that goes to improving air quality in the Phoenix metropolitan area. Um, and with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Do they have any idea how they're going to distribute that money? Are they going to do it on size of cities? Um, so currently, earlier this year during the summer, the governor put out a proposal that would give 38, about 38 million to replace school buses for clean um, diesel buses and it, they would benefit the entire state. And so that proposal was put out, I want to say at the end of June, and they're still working through the proposals that were submitted to the state. Okay, thank you. Next. Mayor. Go ahead. <laughs> Mayor and committee members, so I'll walk through the federal agenda items. Um, the federal ha agenda has two guiding principles, the first to promote fiscal sustainability and the second to protect local authority. So on behalf of the Water Department, the agenda includes continuing to support dedicated funding for system conservation, um, supporting efforts to allow contractors such as the city to create and contribute additional water to the intentionally created surplus located in Lake Mead, and then also support forest restoration projects within the entire state as a whole. On behalf of the Environmental Programs Department, we will continue to support legislation that would provide federal funding for environmental assessment, cleanup, and redevelopment efforts that occur in brownfields. And then on behalf of the Sustainability Department, we would continue to pursue grants and assistance that help to expand um, electric vehicle infrastructure throughout the city, continue to pursue grants and assistance that help with tree planting throughout the city and increase the urban tree canopy, and then continue to pursue grants and assistance to encourage renewable energy um, projects throughout the region. 
Mayor and Council members, uh, committee members, that's a short presentation on the items for this subcommittee, and um, we recommend staff approval for the items um, that we presented. Any questions? Yeah. Uh, Vice Mayor, do you have any questions? I don't. Okay. Do I have a motion to approve the recommendation? So moved. Okay, and I will second. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Uh, item four. Good morning, Mayor, Vice Mayor, and Councilwoman Stark. Um, we're here today to seek your approval to apply for a zero interest lease purchase agreement um, from the closed loop fund to make necessary improvements to our North Gateway uh, MRF materials recovery facility. It's our recycling plant, uh, which opened to the public in 2006. Uh, the closed loop fund is comprised of Fortune 500 companies, uh, and they're making investments around the nation in recycling infrastructure and technology. Um, their uh, partners include Amazon, Coca-Cola, Johnson & Johnson, uh, P&G, and Unilever, just to uh, recognize a few of their partners, and they're making a $100 million investment throughout the nation. Um, so this will allow us to make improvements to our MRF, much needed improvements, um, to meet the changing demands and challenges in the recycling market, uh, and to improve the lifespan of our MRF. This is a zero interest uh, lease purchase agreement. So with me today, I have Joe Jadis, who is our assistant director, assistant public works director for solid waste. And then we also have at the table, who I'd like to introduce to you is Rick Peters. He's one of the newer members of our management team and deputy director over dis diversion and disposal. I'd like to point out that Rick brings over 30 years of experience from the private sector, um, eight of those years working, running recycling plants throughout the nation, and he has three years of experience working specifically with our MRF uh, up at North Gateway. Also, in the audience, I'd like to recognize Alberto Guardado. He is general manager with Republic Services, who is our current uh, MRF operator. And with that, I'll turn it over to Joe Jadis. All right, well, good morning. So in April of this year, we presented to you a market update on the recycling market. I think you were both there for that. And in fact, uh, you guys both took the advantage of coming out and touring the North Gateway Materials Recovery mm -hmm. Facility. So you've seen some of this stuff firsthand. Um, and you might recall that in April, we talked about um, the market signals that we were receiving and some strategies to respond to that. So um, one of those strategies was related to infrastructure, and that is the purpose of our conversation here today. So a little bit of a refresh um, from infrastructure challenges perspective, we have kind of three different things that we're dealing with. Um, the first being some obsolete infrastructure, and I'm going to speak about both of our MRFs here for a second. Um, obsolete infrastructure really can take two forms in the context with which I'm discussing. In one form, it is the equipment is just past its useful life. It's not performing to the specifications it was originally designed to perform to. Typically in this industry, that's like 15 to 20 years. Um, and we have that problem facing us, in particular at our 27th Avenue facility, a little bit less so at our North Gateway facility. But obsolescence can also mean, and in this case, it applies to our North Gateway facility, that the technology is just outdated and there's newer, better technology that performs much better. And that's really the situation we're dealing with more so at our North Gateway facility. We also have a change in the composition stream. So uh, where m these facilities were designed with paper being a very, very dominant um, inbound commodity, about 80%, and a lot of the screening and conveying and all the equipment was designed for that. Well, we see less paper and more plastics, for example. And so we need to adapt to that changing commodity stream and be thoughtful about what types of additional changes are coming at us in the future. And then uh, the third thing, and the thing that really kind of brought us to the head of making a, some infrastructure decisions now is the market signals that we received. So for many years, uh, China has been buying most of our commodity with respect to paper and cardboard. Um, and that's been throughout m much of the Western US, much of Europe. 
but they have been signaling market changes and really made major shifts last year uh, in changing the kinds of specifications that were required. So part of this symbiotic relationship um, with China um, is that they, um, we buy a lot of goods that are shipped here in shipping containers across the ocean. And instead of those shipping containers going back empty, they were being filled up with recycling. In fact, it was like the top export for the United States for a number of years was recyclable commodities. Um, but China has changed its policies with respect to, in some cases, just flat out banning certain materials, and in other cases, just changing the quality specifications. But most of the recycling centers that have been built over the last 20 or 30 years weren't designed to meet those, these new quality specifications. So modifications are necessary. Um, and so we shared this with you, I think, back in April as well. Um, what you're seeing here is uh, the blue line represents the inbound recycling that we're processing at our two recycling centers. So what you can see, which is not at all unexpected, is we're having more volume coming at us. The city continues to grow. The economy has been good. And those are typical signs of additional recycling um, coming in. And that's the pattern we're seeing. Unfortunately, the green line represents um, our revenue. And what we've seen here is a decline. And if we were to plot out what 2018 were to look like here, we're not quite through the year yet, but that decline would continue. Um, and mostly that is because these new specifications have required adjustments to how the facility is operated. And the material, a lot of the material we used to capture and be able to sell, we're losing. And it's winding up going out as landfill material. So the real objective here is that we want to make imp infrastructure improvements so that we can recapture that material again and get it back into a sold market. So again, uh, we had talked about three actions. And in specifically today, we're going to focus on infrastructure and capital improvement recommendations. Um, so uh, we're, our focus today is just related to North Gateway. We will address 27th Avenue at, at a future time. So now I'm going to turn it over to uh, Mr. Peters, who's going to share with you a little bit more about these improvements. Uh, Mayor, subcommittee members, good morning. Um, I actually brought a prop today. I'll work this into the conversation here a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> I drank it too. Um, but why does the North Gateway MRF need to be um, upgraded? I guess uh, I, since I ran this facility for three and a half years for the prior contractor, I have a pretty good understanding of how this system is supposed to operate. So when I took this picture, actually, that you're looking at right here, I took that picture in September. And I took it because uh, it is actually a good example of what's wrong. Now, when I would go to recycling plants, and I had six of them total that I managed, the first place I would go to is the residue conveyor. Because the residue conveyor is sort of a way to measure how effective your recycling system is, is working. If, there, if it's working good in capturing all the material, the only thing going out there is trash. And, and it's trash that's physically removed by sorters or wasn't captured by the system. Since the China Sword Initiative uh, hit, which really the full impact uh, was uh, started in about August of last year is where it started affecting the, 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 uh, the operation, you're now seeing more recyclables on this conveyor than you are trash. In fact, that pile you see two-thirds of that pile is actually material that used to be recovered and sold. It's now going out as residue. That's get pushed into a trailer and is hauled off to SR-85. That's a problem. So the question is, why did that happen? And I guess I have to explain a little bit why the, what the China National Swords, how that affected the, the, the operations of the plant. So, and that's what's really causing a lot of these changes. When North Gateway was built in 2006, it has uh, three what they call news screens. And a news screen is basically, it's a technology that helps separate, um, like when you have paper and carp and uh, plastics mixed together, the news screen helps separate those things. Back in 2006, most of the PET was two liter bottles. And so those screens were able to more easily separate it. But you also had a quality spec in the industry that um, newspaper bales, a bale of newspaper could have up to two and a half percent contamination. China's national sword reduced that to 0.5%. You know, that's really saying taking a newspaper bale, 
that you, a 2,000 pound bale could have before to pass 50 pounds of, of non-newspaper, now all of a sudden it could have only less than 10. It caused drastic changes in the way the operator had to run this facility. Uh, they had to slow the system down, um, and this is a Republic Services then was in taking over from 30 tons an hour was running this plant down to 20. Um, they had to add headcount, and they had to alter these old 2006 newspaper screens to try to produce that quality spec, which it wasn't designed to do. And so the consequence of adjusting those screens is by material being lost out this residue conveyor, good material. And in fact, it's not a small number. Um, prior to National Sword, um, out of the 6,200 inbound tons to this facility, about 20 to 25 percent was going out as residue. Since National Sword, that number is in excess of 50 percent. We're losing more material than we're recovering right now, and that is really the problem. And, and it's, Republic has done, I think, a good job of making adjustments as, as much as they can, but the technology just is it's fighting, uh, it's fighting them, and so they're, they're, they're struggling. So we went to Republic Services and asked them, what do we need to do to fix this plant? And they came up with some recommendations to replace the old uh, news screens with some two state-of-the-art anti-wrapping screens. They're going to add two optical sorters, which optical sorters use, uh, use jets of air to help separate. So we continue to have given additional technology to help separate paper from plastics. And um, a ballistic separator, which also, again, another piece of technology to also help break plastics from paper. And uh, that upgrade would restore our ability to capture all that material that's being lost. And we could go back from, from a cost factor back to a commodity and, set, and being sold. So we asked Republic to, to, what do we need to do? They came to us with uh, what, what needs to happen to fix this. And that's really kind of. I can move on to the next slide here. Um, so you've heard already a little bit from Ginger about the closed loop fund. I, I want to talk about this a little bit because uh, it does have a role to play in the discussion that we're currently having. You know, it's a fund basically of $100 million from some of the largest corporations in the United States. And this, this fund goes around um, offering interest-free loans to municipalities for projects that they consider that advance uh, um, recycling or sustainability type of, of projects. We took our North Gateway upgrade project to them and said, what do you think of this? Uh, they, they actually felt it met all the criteria that, that, the, that they, they were comfortable with and said, yeah, we would be willing to front a good portion of what you need to fix your plant. So that was actually really a, a real positive thing, that they actually felt that our plant was, uh, met their needs or requirements. So what are we talking about in terms of costs? Um, I'll get right into that. Um, we're looking at four and a half million dollars. You're talking about six new pieces of equipment. So it's a lot of equipment that needs to go in there. Um, but the benefits, I think, because you're going to get into that, far outweigh the costs. How do they anticipate funding for this? The closed loop fund is offered to contribute three million dollars of interest-free money that this has to be paid back over a five-year period. Another source. Uh, City of Peoria is actually a current IGA customer. We take the recycling at North Gateway. They've offered to contribute a million dollars to this project. They recognize what's going on in this industry, and they want to they want to help. They want to be a partner. Uh, and the rest of the balance would come from the City of Phoenix. So that's how we anticipate sort of funding this this upgrade. The benefits, some of you already heard, is just taking that that large pile and moving it from. Right now, as a cost going out at $17 a ton to the landfill, restoring it back to uh, commodities or that with, with value. Um, the, the biggest one of benefit, I think, from, for, the, for the operator is uh, where they had to slow down from 30 down to 20. They, this, this upgrade would allow them to in, in, bump back up the operating speed, which, for the operator's perspective, this is the, uh, really the way the processor has to make their money. They get paid a processing fee. They need to run at speed. So the speed part is really important to say to Rep our partner, Republic Services. Um, the restoration of revenue, that looks like a big number. It's because we're losing big, big amount of volume. So um, the average value of the material that um, was on that floor that you saw was $100 a ton. That's the average value that we've shipped out year to date is $100 a ton. It's a significant amount of volume that's being lost. We restore that. You recover that revenue, and it's 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 again it's significant. 
the other benefit of this uh, upgrade is the you're, you're adding these optical sorters, which will give you the ability to uh, create new different types of products if you want. So it's more adaptable uh, with, with, with the changes in the stream. Um, and so that's something that's really important, I think, is that we would have uh, a system that could also change as, if, as, as consumer uh, you know, um, demand and uh, use changes on, in terms of the in, uh, inbound stream. And the last thing, which is important, uh, is right now all that same that material that we're, we're, we're going to take in, in, uh, off the tip floor to turn it back to a sellable commodity is no longer going out to SR85 as cost. I didn't mention this, but 24,000 tons at uh, $17 a ton, you're talking about a half a million dollars. So I didn't even factor that in any of my, my projected savings. You get a half a million dollars of reduced costs from landfill expense just by converting that back to sellable. Um, my last slide that I have is the cost-benefit analysis. And this is one that, again, on the private sector, it would be very easy for me to uh, you know, get, um, make a case here. The blue line that you're looking at is the cost to pay back a closed loop fund. And you'll see there's a payment there every, for the first five years. That's what, what, what that is. The orange line is the, uh, the re revenue that is net of that payment to the city of Phoenix from restoring that lost um, material. So that's what, and in 2024, you see the payment to the closed loop fund has been fully satisfied. All that revenue then is coming back to us uh, free and clear. So that's really the um, presentation that I had uh, on why we need to do this. Thank you, Rick. Um, so Mayor, Vice Mayor, and Councilwoman Stark, that is our presentation, and we're seeking your approval today uh, to enter into this lease purchase agreement with the closed loop fund. Okay, we do have one card, Alberto. Good morning, Mayor and uh, members of the committee. Uh, my name is Alberto Guardado. I'm the general manager for Republic Services, the current operator of the North Gateway uh, Material Recovery Facility. And Republic Services operates about 90 material recovery facilities across North America. Uh, I just wanted to take a couple minutes to uh, echo um, what has been shared, which is we support uh, this upgrade. Uh, we are making similar investments in some of our plants across the country. And um, as part of our partnership with the city of Phoenix, hope that the uh, committee will um, move forward with the recommendation of staff. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Um, any questions? No. Vice Mayor, do you have any questions? I don't. Okay. Do I have a motion? Uh, so move. I think this is pretty critical. So I, I support this. Okay. Second. Motion and a second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> You'll have to invite us out again when you have this installed so yes. we can see how it works. <laughs> uh, Mayor, members of the committee, this next item um, is brought forward um, at the request. Oh, no, wait. Next item is an update regarding our community food assessment and we have special guests with us today that uh, that will get introduced in a moment come on up guys I'm just seeing their faces when you were skipping over them okay. <laughs> good morning mayor good morning subcommittee uh, today we're going to give you an update on our community food assessment and Phoenix food action plan uh, we have Roseanne Albright from the Office of Environmental Programs and Kate O'Neill from the Maricopa County Food Systems Coalition. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Roseanne and Kate. All right. Thank you. Good morning, Mayor Williams and members of the subcommittee. We appreciate the opportunity to come and talk to you and share some news with you about our local food system. Food is a way of bringing family together. It's how we show we care. These are statements made by Phoenicians when asked about what they value about food. Food is more than just sustenance. It's about health, community, and maybe a little bit of love, too. 
Our focus on food comes from the 2050 sustainability goals that were approved by City Council in 2016, which included a local food system goal to maintain a sustainable, healthy, equitable, thriving local food system. Prior to that, in 2015, Phoenix voters approved a healthy food system goal in our general plan, Plan Phoenix. Achieving this goal improves the quality of life for all of our residents by significantly reducing the rates of hunger, obesity, and diet-related diseases. It improves the economy and helps secure food for Phoenix for the long term. The Office of Environmental Programs is the goal leader, and we've been working with food system professionals <coughs> over a couple of years, and we've taken steps toward developing a food action plan to help us achieve that goal. One of those first steps in developing a plan is to conduct a community food assessment, which is a tool that tells us about the food assets and food needs of a community or region. So to provide a high-level overview of the assessment findings is Kate O'Neill. She is the chair of the Food Assessment Coordination Team for the Maricopa County Food System Coalition, or MARCO. And she brings with, us, with her 13 years of experience building regional food systems ranging from managing a community farmer's market to the development and implementation of healthy food policy in the state of Michigan. We're really lucky to have her. So I'm going to turn it over to Kate. Thank you. Good morning, Mayor Williams and members of the subcommittee. It's a privilege to be here today to give you a brief overview of the results of our regional food assessment. In 2015, Marco received a $150,000 grant from the Gila River Indian community through the city of Phoenix to take a snapshot of how the food system operates within and near Maricopa County, specifically focusing on what's working well and what could use some improvement. Now, the food system is considerably more complex than this visual suggests. It's so complex that we could literally spend the rest of our lives trying to study it. So Marco decided to look at assets and issues related to growers, eaters, and the networks that link the two. We relied on several partners to complete this assessment. The University of Arizona Cooperative Extension conducted our economic contribution analysis. We relied on Maricopa County Public Health and other Marco members for some data sets and studies on health, hunger, and food access. Some additional partners included the nationally recognized Crossroads Resource Center, Community Alliance Consulting, and the Planning Center out of Tucson. From our economic contribution analysis, we learned that on-farm agriculture in Maricopa County contributes an estimated $1.95 billion to our local economy through direct, indirect, and induced multiplier effects. Maricopa County is an agricultural leader in both the state of Arizona and in the nation. The food system is working particularly well for producers in the milk, poultry, and egg industry largely due in part for the high demand for fresh milk and dairy that exists in the growing metro region. But not all of our farmers are reaping those rewards. An overwhelming majority of farmers, many of which are small growers, share just 5% of all sales, with 30% of all growers reporting less than $1,000 in annual sales. Our regional and global food system is not working well for many eaters either. High rates of diet-related disease and hospitalization translate to higher health care costs, lower worker productivity, and poorer quality of life. Food access and food insecurity are major contributors to this, with one in five Maricopa County children experiencing limited or uncertain availability of food, and about half of residents surveyed through the recent Maricopa County Community Health Needs Assessment, noting that they struggle to pay for essentials like food, housing, and clothing. We explored these issues a little further with residents through our community food conversations in Tempe, Glendale, and South Phoenix. And we learned that people overwhelmingly want high quality, fresh, nutritious foods. And they're often limited in their ability to access those foods due to issues related to affordability, transportation, time, and the availability of places that sell high quality foods. Many people in South Phoenix told us that they prefer to shop at higher quality stores in more affluent neighborhoods that offer better quality produce. They told us that they don't like to shop at the stores nearest to them 
because they don't want to waste money on food that will go bad the next day. Just to kind of reiterate the implications of this, so residents who are the most strapped for time, financial, and transportation resources have to spend more of those limited resources to travel farther distances to shop for the high quality, nutritious, and healthy foods that they want. Many people that we talked to in South Phoenix were conscious of how much money that they're spending outside of their community, and they no longer want to do so. Strengthening community food networks is an emerging strategy to address both the needs of small growers and many low-income eaters by creating unique and social commercial connections that add value and competitive advantage that's not possible through the mainstream food system. So Marco really wanted to understand what our community food networks look like, um, what the strengths are, and what, what the major threats were. Now this is an image of our local food network, and I'd love to be invited back in the future to discuss all the connections and what the icons mean. Unfortunately, I only have time to highlight some of the strengths and weaknesses. Key strengths of this food network in Maricopa County include the fact that existing growers producing for local markets are highly skilled. Again, they're some of the highest skilled growers in the nation. Consumers demand high quality fresh food and they truly value the role that food plays in building community and in connections. Food system organizations and leaders are strong. Many of the strongest connecting nodes in that network map I showed on the previous slide represent public agencies and nonprofits here in the Valley. Independent distributors like Peddlers and Sons, um, Stern Produce and Green on Purpose are engaged and committed, and they play an essential role in linking eaters, growers, and buyers. Some of the key weaknesses facing community food networks in the county include the fact that consumers, institutions, and civic leaders have limited interest. Many are putting all of their local food eggs in the community garden or the farmer's market baskets. And while these are extremely important in building strong food systems, they're just two strategies and they're often quite limited. So there's definitely a need to diversify market opportunities for growers, buyers, and eaters. There are just too few growers to meet demand for farmer's markets. Many of our growers are facing retirement and creating new growers is extremely challenging. Access to affordable land and water for food production represents the most immediate threat to current and future producers, and one of the most critical threats to our ability to feed ourselves if, there were to, if we were to face a national or global food supply chain shortage. Many growers that we talk to cannot afford the land that they grow on, and they have to lease that land. Many have been kicked off that land when the owner is ready to sell or develop. For example, Steadfast Farms out in Queen Creek has designed the majority of his operation as a mobile operation so that he can up and move at a moment's notice and minimize his crop losses. Growers and residents feel isolated and underrepresented. Growers particularly felt that institutions and leaders are unaware of the unique issues that they face as small businesses. And strategic planning and coordination within and among network actors is lacking, especially in regards to education. So in brief summary, many residents have trouble achieving a healthy diet. There seems to be a disconnect between current demand for fresh foods and local small food producers. There seems to be a disconnect between farming and the rest of us. And the ability for us to feed ourselves long term is threatened by our aging farmer population and access to affordable agricultural land and water. Addressing these challenges is going to take a lot of creativity and collaboration. And we hope that you will look to Marco in the future as a valuable resource. We also look forward to including the city of Phoenix in our efforts to build community through the sharing and celebration of food. Thank you. Thank you, Kate, um, for the information. And thank you to Marco for taking on this important work because it is setting the foundation for the work that we're doing in developing our food action plan. As a matter of fact, the Marco Policy Work Group is assisting us and is preparing recommendations for developing or improving zoning and land use policies for food production 
showing us how to incorporate and providing recommendations on urban agriculture into economic development and sharing opportunities to support small and medium-sized producers. We continue to engage with health organizations. We've met with Dignity Health, Banner, Mercy Maricopa, just to name a few. We will be reaching out to farmers to learn more details about their challenges and opportunities for improvements. And the partners that we uh, engaged with more formally earlier this year are continuing to provide us valuable support as we work through our plan and as they also work to improve food access. And that's the Health Improvement Partnership of Maricopa County, Valley of the Sun United Way, and Marco. And we continue to work and talk with residents in our city. As a matter of fact, just last week, we completed a community food conversation and workshop made possible through a technical assistance grant from the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency's Local Foods, Local Places program. So the focus was on improving healthy food access and the intersection with future development. So we had about 70 people attend over the two days with the goal of developing a targeted mini food action plan specifically for the South Phoenix area that we could implement with nonprofits, businesses, other government agencies, and most importantly, with the support and partnership of people living in South Phoenix. So we're excited to continue this work and we intend to replicate this workshop in the Maryvale and West Phoenix area as well. So we'll continue to gather input, recommendations, ideas, and formulate our draft Phoenix Food Action Plan and we intend to submit it for stakeholder review in spring of 2019 and then we'll bring it back to subcommittee for approval and ultimately finally to full city council for approval. So we expect that we will be back to provide the details of that plan and what those recommendations look like. So thank you for allowing us the opportunity to bring food to the table. Mm -hmm. And we're happy to take any questions. I just have one quick question. Councilwoman. Um, there's a lot of uh, grocery stores now that are doing delivery. I, I, I've never taken advantage of it, so I don't know. Is it an affordability issue? Is that a way that might be able to help parts of our city or yeah we it, it was mentioned in a recent community food conversation and it's just recently come up in other types of conversations we don't know a lot about it but the residents mentioned that it requires a credit card oh, okay. um, and so that limits it for some some residents okay. uh, vice mayor do you have any questions I don't okay I, I have one question uh, it said talked about changing in zoning. Do you have any idea what you're saying or doing with that? Right. Currently, some of the recommendations are to make improvements for making it easier to have community gardens, making it easier to have farmers markets, and then exploring uh, new uh, technologies for doing farming, like farming, hydroponics farming inside buildings or inside containers and the kinds of zoning that would be required for those kinds of operations, which are also very sustainable and effectively use water and can produce a lot on a small piece of land versus in-ground farming, which takes up quite a bit of land. So those kinds of recommendations will be coming as we continue to explore what other cities are doing, what other locations are doing, and what works for our city. And do the small growers have to have some type of inspection, health inspection, county food evaluation, something? The um, Arizona F Farm Bureau and the State Department of Agriculture are the ones that enforce regulations and inspections. So a lot of the farmers have to have what is called GIPGAP, good, uh, good management practices, basically, certifications in order to do certain types of farming. So there's definitely a lot of watch right now, especially since we've heard about E. coli and lettuce and all of that mm -hmm. happening. One of the advantages to having local farmers is that you know exactly where your product is coming from. As a matter of fact, we had one of our uh, uh, food hub distributors when there was the E. coli uh, warning last week or so, he was able to reach out to his local farmer and the farmer tested his lettuce and was able, able to certify that his lettuce was fine. So that's one of those advantages to having local farms. Thank you. So do we need a motion? We don't. I think this is information only. Okay. Well, thank you, ladies. I look forward to having you come back and explain uh, the entire plan and 
how you are accomplishing your goals. Okay. Okay. So this uh, next item, Mayor, members of the subcommittee, has the misleading name of System Development Changes Charges Update. Um, uh, this grows out of a request uh, from Councilwoman Stark regarding impact fees. Mm -hmm. On the conversation that we had last month about uh, impact fees as a potential source of revenue for solid waste infrastructure. So to answer that and many more questions today, <laughs> we have our. Planning and Development Team, Alan Stevenson, Director. Go ahead. Thank you, Mayor, uh, members of the subcommittee. I also have with me Adam Miller, who is our infrastructure financing uh, team leader, deals with all the impact fee issues. And yes, as Karen said, it's a fancy way to say impact fees. Um, and uh, the, the direct uh, answer to the question that Councilwoman Stark uh, asked about being able to charge impact fees for public works uh, facilities um, is that no, we can't do that. Um, uh, we used to do that in the past, but in 2012, uh, the state legislature changed uh, the requirements um, with the Center of the Home Builders Association, along with others, went in and petitioned the state to make some changes. What they, one of the key ones they did was make sure that there was a definition of critical infrastructure, um, and that's what you could charge impact fees for. Um, and within that, the public works category was not included um, in that. So there were uh, parks and preserve fees that were not included in that and some other things as well. But it principally tried to focus the, the legislative ability of cities on really providing that critical infrastructure that is needed to serve an area where there aren't some other fees and other ways to pay for, for some of that. Go ahead. Uh, on that note, does that also mean for other types of vehicles like fire and police, are they no longer considered critical? No, um, and, and Adam can, can address that in, in, in a minute. Um, okay. There are some other things that, that we can do with that, and so Adam can, can talk okay. about that. I'm sorry. But we did want to take this opportunity um, to really provide the subcommittee with a quick update on the uh, infrastructure financing plan, which is is the plan that you put together to charge the impact fees, and that plan uh, is being updated. Um, one of the, the requirements uh, in that state statute of 2012 was that you have to update the plan uh, every 10 years, or uh, actually say every five years, but it's a 10-year growth window that you have to look at. And so one of the key differences in the past prior to 2012 was you could charge a, an impact fee based upon a complete picture of what is the infrastructure that's going to be needed to serve in this particular area? And um, what has cha changed with 2012 is it's only a 10-year window. So you can only charge for infrastructure for 10 years of growth, not everything. And that presents some challenges when you're talking about some of the bigger infrastructure items and how you phase growth and development. Uh, because if you're leapfrogging over and around things, that really is hard to contain a, a cost in that 10-year window. because you don't know where the, the growth is going to happen, but if you're charging uh, for the infrastructure that's going to be needed to serve those items, it adds significant cost. Um, and so one of the key items that will we'll come back around that the council will also be involved in is helping us figure out where we're going to um, grow in some of those areas, particularly up north, um, because there's several different you know areas from uh, you know the far uh, east side in Vice Mayor Waring's district for Paradise Ridge and and Desert Ridge, uh, all the way over uh, to the far west side uh, where Mayor Williams uh, in her hat as District 1 council person represents uh, stuff with 67th Avenue and north of the CAP. And so we can't serve all of that at one time in a tenure window, so we've got to focus some of that growth. But first, I do want to um, kind of provide an overview for uh, those watching and others who aren't really familiar with impact fees. And so Impact fees help the city pay for uh, needed city facilities for growth and development. So they pay for things like, uh, you know, major regional streets, uh, backbone water, sewer infrastructure, uh, fire stations, those kinds of things. They only apply in designated areas. Um, they're charged at the time of a building permit, but it's all based upon a plan that takes into account this is the infrastructure that is in there that you're financing with that plan. So. That's where it gets to be that critical timing issue because you can't just go add infrastructure in to serve an area out here if it's not in part of your adopted plan because you're not charging a fee to assess that all uh, for everyone who builds in that area. 
there is a state statute and case law that really regulates it. And I'm going to turn it over to Adam to go through some of the details of how we, our impact fee program works, and then we'll talk about the overall timing uh, right after that. Great. Thank you, Alan. Good morning, Mayor, members of the subcommittee. I uh, appreciate the opportunity to, pardon me, uh, get the mic going here. Uh, good morning, Mayor and, and subcommittee members. Uh, appreciate the opportunity to be here to, to go over some of the specifics of, of what we do charge uh, with respect to impact fees at the City of Phoenix. Um, where those fees are charged, uh, what, what that looks like just in terms of the cost. Uh, we'll take a look at some of the recent projects that have been completed by the city using it, the impact fee program. And then I'll turn it back over to Alan and, and uh, he'll provide a little bit more detail on the update process that, uh, that he mentioned in the intro. So the city uh, currently has nine impact fee programs that support various departments, uh, capital programs. You can see them listed there on the slide, uh, but we, we charge impact fees for our public safety programs, both fire and police, and that does include uh, fire and police vehicles um, to respond to Councilman Stark's question. Uh, Can I ask a quick question on that? Uh, in the North area, I know in the vice mayor's uh, area, they have potential for great flooding. When it talks about storm drainage, does that mean channeling some of those areas or providing extra um, infrastructure to deal with it? So, Mayor, members of the subcommittee, um, in the, the north area, um, we don't currently charge a storm drainage uh, impact fee. That only uh, is down south. Um, uh, and that's principally because what you see up north is a lot more of a natural wash response where we require developers to preserve some of the natural washes and that provides for some of those channels. Um, and, and then developers as part of their development requirements have to retain water on their site. So um, that's one, one issue there. When you turn to Levine and, and South Phoenix and some of those areas, we charge there because that natural river uh, and drainage system uh, was removed by farmers, you know, 75, 100 years ago. It was fine for water to, uh, you know, run into the crops and provide extra water and growth, but that doesn't work so well when there's homes and people living there. Um, and so we're using that money that we're charging down there to recreate and put some of that back in with matching money from the, the flood control district on projects to address down there. We are, as part of this update, looking at adding a drainage impact fee, particularly for the Paradise Ridge area that is along Scottsdale Road and going over to 64th Street from Joe Max down to the 101 is a really critical area. There has been a flood control district study for that whole wash corridor up there. And so one of the uh, items that we've reached agreement with the State Land Department, who's the current landowner, is to explore um, a drainage fee for that area that will allow the city to come up with some matching funds to uh, to be able to map partner with the flood control district on those improvements for that portion. Thank you. So the city is currently charging impact fees for all of the categories of public service that are allowed under the state statute. Uh, as Alan mentioned, uh, we don't charge all of the fees in all of the fee areas, and so that'll show up again when we when we look at the at the actual charges themselves. Um, but as I was, was mentioning, uh, we cover our, our public safety departments, uh, the parks and library departments are collecting fees for uh, storm drainage, as we just discussed. Major arterials would be our street-related uh, development impact fee. Uh, and then three uh, uh, programs that, that benefit the water department's capital program, water and wastewater, of course, uh, and in addition, the water resources acquisition fee. You'll see the asterisk on the water resource acquisition fee uh, from a legal perspective and as it relates to our, our uh, requirements pursuant to state impact fee rules, the water resource acquisition fee falls under all of those requirements and so we include it here, but it is adopted under a different section of city code uh, and it also is charged uh, in, in a larger area that's actually charged citywide. So here's a map of the impact fee areas. I can see on the screen that some of those, those colors are washing out a little bit. Um, these areas were originally designated uh, several decades ago. Uh, they largely follow uh, some of the, the village uh, boundaries, and there really haven't been 
uh, significant changes to the to the designated impact fee areas. Uh, the changes that have occurred have generally occurred because of annexations, and, and probably the most notable uh, would be extending that northwest area up to include the Rio Vista Village and and uh, the west of I-17 up near up near the Anthem Mall uh, location. Uh, this is a look at the uh, water resource acquisition fee area. As I mentioned, it is different. It's charged uh, citywide. Uh, these boundaries are delimited, delimited by the Salt River Project member lands. Uh, I won't get into the nuances of all of the city's uh, water supplies, um, but uh, I will remind council that the Salt River Project uh, supplies do come with restrictions with respect to where the where that water can be used within the city. And so that largely explains why the water resource acquisition fee gets separated into these two these two locations. Uh, what everybody's wondering is how much is a, an impact fee? Uh, this is a look at at our eight uh, development impact fee areas listed uh, on the left side of that table, as well as the two uh, water resource acquisition fee areas at the bottom. Uh, the, the acronym NIFA is the non-impact fee area, and you see off-project uh, and on-project. On-project being the location that the Salt River Project water can be used. Uh, you can see for the development impact fees, uh, we, we see a pretty significant range uh, from about $6,500 in Ahwatukee to almost $15,000 in the northeast area, our Desert View Village. Uh, that range is, is really explained by the mix of infrastructure that's required in those areas. Uh, as Alan mentioned, the storm drainage fee is only currently charged in Levine and in Estrella, so that, that fee doesn't apply in the other impact fee areas. The other uh, consideration that really comes into play here is there's just different characteristics when you look uh, across such a large city. And particularly if you think about the north and, and the mountains and the elevation changes, uh, those characteristics uh, mean that the cost to provide services uh, changes. And in particular, if you think about the water and the, infra and the wastewater system uh, where we're dealing with a lot of elevation change, it just requires more facilities to provide the same level of service. Uh, variation in land value uh, will also play into that, that variability uh, because we do acquire land for some, for some of the fee categories. Uh, I think one thing that may be jumping out at you is that the water resource acquisition fee is zero uh, on project currently. Um, Alan did briefly mention a provision in state rules that uh, require that we are only planning for 10 years uh, of growth or 10 years of new demand. Uh, so, so what we're looking at with the water resource acquisition fee is 10 years of growth on project uh, and what is our, our outlook um, in terms of demand growth look for our 100-year water supply requirement under a, under a drought scenario. Um, I, I would just mention that as you think about that and we think about how development takes place on project in the older areas, much of what we're dealing with is redevelopment. And so we aren't seeing the demand increases that we see in the, in the new development areas where as we add a new house, we're adding new, de new demand with that. Uh, and just to, before I turn it over to Alan, just a, a quick overview of some of the recent projects that I think will be familiar uh, to, to the council and, and to the viewers. Uh, Fire Station 58 is a, a station that was recently expanded in the Levine area. Uh, station 55 is the fire station that's planned for I-17 and Joe Max Road. Uh, that project is actually involving a combination of fire impact fees and street impact fees. Uh, to do some improvements to, to Joe Max Road there at the I-17 interchange. Uh, the Lake Pleasant Water Treatment Plant, not a new facility per se, but we are uh, continuing to use impact fee revenue to help pay down a share of the debt for uh, the Lake Pleasant Treatment Plant. And Deer Valley Drive, if you haven't had a chance to uh, drive the new section between Cave Creek Road and North Black Mountain Boulevard, uh, you should do so. I think the street department and the, the developer did a fantastic job uh, on that project. And, and that was a, a private public partnership involving the impact fee program to get that work completed. Uh, and then finally, the, the Durango Regional Conveyance Channel uh, is kind of the sister project to the Levine area conveyance channel. Uh, Durango Channel will be serving the Estrella area. Uh, this is a partnership between the city and the flood control district. 
and my understanding is that the, uh, the contractors are mobilizing uh, as we speak to, to get started on that project. Uh, that's all I have, and I'll let Alan take, take us to the end. Thank you, Adam. Uh, Mayor, members of the subcommittee, I think one of the, the key things I want to hit on, uh, Adam just mentioned the, the Deer Valley Road Improvement Project. And, and so that was something where the Streets Transportation Department worked really well with the private sector. In that case, it was Pulte Homes and, and Taylor Morrison. They bought 500 acres of state land. And Deer Valley uh, Road in, in that portion the Reach 11, uh, and there's a park uh, that has a whole bunch of soccer fields and everything right there. So the city owns part of that street. But because of the topography that is up there, you couldn't just build a half street. A normal you know, development requirement is they're required to build their half street. In this case, they would have had to build the half street for Deer Valley Road, but there would have been no corresponding south half of, of the street. And so what the street transportation department was able to do in working with the developer was use the impact fees monies that have been collected up in that area and then give that uh, money to uh, the, um, the private development team as part of their construction of building their north half, they also built the south half. And so we were able to be much more efficient with the monies collected because it was one project that was building the entire road as opposed to, to two separate projects. And it also worked much better for the constituents in Vice Mayor Waring's district who were clamoring for some additional access into and out of the Desert Ridge area. And so this really was a, a good example of how impact fees were used to kind of close some of that gap and address a community need, but at the same time facilitate development that will help us provide for additional impact fees to pay for more growth as we continue. Um, at the onset, we mentioned that uh, we do have a group that's been put together, and this is our ad hoc committee. Whenever we do uh, an impact fee uh, update, we have an ad hoc committee that we put together that basically is advising staff on what should we do with these impact fees. Uh, and so we have members on there from the Parks and Recreation Board, uh, from the large and small developers like Sunbelt Holdings on the large side, uh, small side going down to uh, some of our you know, uh, smaller commercial guys, uh, Valley Partnership, those trade groups are also a part of this group in total. There's uh, 15, uh, 15 members, and as part of that, um, we have had a couple meetings with them uh, dealing with the information gathering, kind of growth projections. Some of the early uh, work has happened uh, with them. We'll continue to work on that because of the, the very regimented state process to adopt impact fees. Um, it is something that takes really a minimum of 225 days uh, to work through that. It will come back to uh, the council one, before we ever hit the public, we'll come and, and brief you guys individually about it, let you know where we're at and give you a, a big picture update. But then we'll start with some of the, the subcommittee meetings and under state statute, it's required to go to the city council for uh, multiple public hearings uh, so that people can come talk about the fees and, and say they oppose them or they want other fees. Uh, so it's a very uh, regimented process that I said. Uh, right now we're on track to bring it forward in fall of 2019 where we'll be uh, asking from the council to the vote uh, by then. You'll probably start seeing more of it on your, uh, you know, kind of agendas and your discussion later uh, this spring, uh, you know, into early part of summer, and then we'll be working towards finalizing, and then the, the bulk of it will hit that fall of next year. Uh, and with that, we're happy to answer any questions. Questions? Okay. I just want to thank you. This was helpful. I know a lot of the laws were changing about the time I retired, so <laughs> that's why I asked a lot of questions. Thank you so much for Vice, the update. Oh, pardon <laughs> me. Vice Mayor, do you have any questions? I don't, Mayor. Thanks for asking. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the presentation, and we look forward to having you come back and tell us of your progress. I think uh, call to the public. We have none. Any future agenda items that are not on our list? Very done. We are adjourned.